A voice says, cry out, but I ask, what shall I cry? All flesh is like grass, and all of its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades when a wind from God blows upon it. Surely, therefore, people are like grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. The earth is the Lord's, with all of its fullness. The world is the Lord's, with all of its inhabitants. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He will receive a blessing from the Lord and a just reward from the God of deliverance. Keith and Barbara and to the entire family. Uh, one thing you always knew about your dad is that he walked fast. Right? He was always walking fast. Walked very fast. To walk with him, he had to keep up. He was a man who had things to do. And he had plans to finish. He had people depending on him. And he always got the job done. Sal Sharon always completed the task. You could count on it. You all did count on it. He was a man you could count on whether it was in the original Sherwin Bakery or in the baking and catering, whether it in his army life or in his personal life, you could count on him. His mother had died when he was a child. Later on, I know he said it was the worst thing that ever happened in his life, but he didn't allow that tragedy to prevent him from moving forward. He grew very close to his dad. He learned the business, and again, he found his way to get the job done. In the army, he served in North Africa, in Italy, and France, and Germany. He was in Patton's army. And again, he could be counted on. He changed procedures to improve usage and utilization in the army. He did the job. And of course, in the family business, he did whatever it took to complete the task. He'd work 13 out of every 14 days. He would have one day off every two weeks. In other words, he put the time in to get the job done. He dealt with the office, with making sure orders were out on time, deliveries, the scheduling of products. He had to be very organized and very dedicated 
13 hour days and longer and then of course he would get a call in the middle of the night if one of the bakers was ill and he'd have to go back and fill in because that's how you get the job done and he was about getting the job done he worked with his brothers they were close it was a, a very large family he spent so much time at work and with the siblings but they needed him and they depended on him and he was there and what's remarkable is not just his resume what's remarkable is that he lived day after day in in stressful situations in a world where an order just couldn't be late right couldn't be late and he'd have to get things done by a deadline and all those pressures and with all of that stress Saul Sherman was the most kind and gentle and soft-spoken person you could want because every day he was easy to be around Stephen you called your father-in-law a man filled with grace with consideration for other human beings. He knew how to make other people feel comfortable. From his earliest years to his days at Wiggins. He set a good example. He never raised his voice. I mean, I saw him off and on for years. He, never, he really never raised his voice. He provided for his family. He served his customers. He got the job done. He worked with his family. He served his country, but he kept his kindness and he kept his evenness. And he didn't need to raise his voice because he respected people. He believed in hiring people in his community, hiring people locally. He wanted to have good relations with members of the community. When he was in the army, he took in a tech sergeant who was African-American, who was freezing, who needed a place to stay over, to be warm, to be treated like a human being. His superiors didn't like it because it was an army that was still segregated. But Saul realized that Getting the job done didn't just mean finishing his tasks. Getting the job done meant being a mensch and remembering what it was the war was all about, which is tolerance and getting along with other people. And when it came to treating others with respect, of course, there was Edith, who became his life partner, his love and his friend. There was always a lot of love and affection between them. Keith and Barbara, you two saw them as a team. You saw them speaking with one voice. At home, usually it was her voice because the home was more her domain. He got the garage, I understand, and she was in charge of everything else. But they complemented each other. They each had their own strengths, and they trusted in each other and in each other's strengths. They had a wonderful group of friends who they socialized with. They also traveled a great deal. Edith knew she had married a wonderful and caring man with a real sense of humor, with loyalty, with optimism, he was always hopeful. And his hopefulness, his optimism, I know you really believe, led to his long life. I mean, he drove a car till he was 95 years old. He was healthy, really, till he was 96. Then he grew more vulnerable in these last few years. I, uh, I know a little bit about baking, probably not as much as Sal. I know with baking, you need all the right ingredients. Sal always had the right ingredients. He had the right temperament, he had a sense of loyalty. He had a very dedicated work ethic. He had a respect for people. He had a drive to do the right thing, to be the right kind of person. He understood numbers, and he also understood people, and that's a wonderful combination. He upheld a family legacy, and he did so with kindness and with decency. And he set a good example for the next generation and for his grandchildren who felt very close to him and learned from him, and a great-grandchild. Listen, the, the Hebrew word for, uh, for parent is very, very similar to the Hebrew word for teacher. And that ultimately is what we hope we can do as parents, is to be able to teach something, teach an ethic to the next generation. I know he never taught you how to do a rose, right, when you were baking. That much he couldn't teach you. He tried. But other than making a good rose, he taught you a lot of things including being gracious and graceful human beings. He was thoughtful. He thought through his life, and he implemented the kind of life to be proud of. He lived with a good name, and he died with a good name. I know we have a word from a grandchild. If you'd like to come forward.
Shlomo Zalman ben Avraham Eliyahu, Allah HaShalom. I have known you by different names through the years. First, you were my grandpa Saul, the kind, gentle man with a sense of humor. I have a vague memory of peering out of a mixing bowl as a toddler at Sherwin's Bakery. You taught me how to play checkers, and you taught me how to golf, a skill you learned yourself only after retirement but you were good enough to win trophies when you used to winter in Florida. I wish you hadn't stopped playing. Then as you got older, battling health issues, you were Shlomo Zalman ben Kayla. Through it all, you didn't lose either your wit or your sense of humor, and you stayed sharp. I remember talking with you about economics and economic principles, which is one of your favorite topics as I got older and was able to understand it. Now, you are Shlomo Zalman ben Avraham Eliyahu. Your father's name was Avraham, but I can compare you with another Avraham, too, the one about whom we read for three Torah portions, this week being the second, Parshat Vayera. This week, the Parsha begins with Avraham opening his home to three strangers who turn out to be angels, helping them despite the extreme heat of the day. Your father would give away bread during the Great Depression, in addition to being a Baal Tzedakah, you took an extended family when they had nowhere to go. Avraham Avinu fought in the war between the four kings and the five kings, as described in last week's Parsha. A member of the greatest generation, you mustered courage that I never could have found within myself to serve in the United States Army. Avraham rescued his nephew Lot from Sodom. You were part of the army that helped to liberate our people from a regime of unbelievable evil. You sacrificed so much for our country and for our people, and working beyond the point of exhaustion to help feed the people of Cleveland. And I'm very grateful that you taught these midot, these wonderful attributes, to your children, the older of which I am proud to call my father. I have been struck while davening the last couple of days by the second blessing in the Amidah. Its focus and its conclusion is Mechayeh HaMetim, the resurrection of the dead. Umekayem emunato lishene afar, he maintains his faith, his truth to those sleeping in the dust. This also parallels with a bracha that we say every morning, either just before or after the blessings over learning Torah. Elokai nishamashin atata bi tohorahi, my God, the soul that you have placed within me is pure. Atavarata, atayatarata, atanafakta bi. You created it. You fashioned it, you breathed it into me. The Ata Mishamara Bekirbi, the Ata Atid Litila Mimeni, Ulahaka Zira Bila Atid Lavo. You safeguarded within me, and, eventu and eventually you will take it from me and restore it to me in time to come. May the day come soon when we are all reunited, ascending to the third and eternal Beit Hamikdash. Besasonu v'simcha, in joy and in happiness. Yehi zichronacha, livracha, may your memory always be for a blessing. Shalom <laughs> 
when I'm Amen. May we all remember the worthy and the righteous deeds that he performed in the land of the living. God is now his portion. May he rest in peace. And we all say amen. Let's be seated, everyone. We offer our condolences, of course, to the family, Edith, Keith, and Sally, Barbara, and Stephen, and the uh, grandchildren, William, Adam, Lee, and Ariel, Whitney, and Adam, great-grandson, Noah. Uh, the family will be receiving guests to observe Shiva at the residence. That's at Wiggins Place, number 331. Wiggins Place, number 331, beginning today, following the burial portion of the service, and continuing today until 8 p.m. Tomorrow, 1 to 4 p.m., Sunday, 1 to 4 p.m. and again 7 to 9 p.m. Monday 1 to 4 p.m. and 7 to 9 p.m. and Tuesday 7 to 9 p.m. That's at Wiggins Place 331. Uh, as I said the family will be receiving visitors beginning today following the burial portion of the service. We're going to now arrange the processional to move to the burial spot. Please remain in your seats for a few more moments. The pallbearers however should now come forward. <laughs> 